Well, you all ready to connect some more dots? Um, because of the amount of information that is coming out of all this, it's hard to uh, basically go back and do a comprehensive every time. So some of the stuff in this video is going to be based on the last video um, where I was tying uh, Christ to the Orion Nebula. If you remember, Christ was tied to wisdom, wisdom was tied to the brain, in Kabbalah, and uh, we see these specific things of how it was all created. It was done by something called emanation. And so in emanation we had this light that came forth um, and what it's described as across culture is uh, it's a pillar which is basically a black hole that comes forth. Um, not a black hole in the sense of what we understand the definition of to be today uh, but it's a different definition. The reason I use the term black hole is because it is familiar to people and so when you say it they get that av immediate visual in their head. And it's described across culture that this pillar uh, began to turn around like a potter's wheel and form patterns outside of it. This is described in the uh, vision of Hermes. Uh, it's described as, as Osiris Ta because Osiris Ta was a potter who fashioned everything from a potter's wheel. These are all the same stories that we hear described. That light began to emanate, and as it emanated out, it created wisdom, and wisdom is associated with the brain. So if we take a look at the Orion Nebula, this area that you see that's the brightest right here is the trapezium. That is where the black hole, so to speak, is, the pillar. That pillar began to emanate out, and it created wisdom, and Earth, was founded upon wisdom. <clears throat> the reason this is significant is because uh, when we take a look at the Earth versus the Orion Nebula, we see that they are mirrors of each other. Uh, we can see this extremely easily when we take a look at the Nile Delta, but even if we back up all the way to the planet itself and comparing it to the Orion Nebula, we can see the same general characteristics, which is something I found a long time ago before I found all of the texts that backed all this stuff up. We're going to go over a little bit of that today, uh, a little bit more on the whole mirror thing. But one of the things that we're going to do uh, is I found some uh, some other uh, connecting information, some other uh, points that connect the dots on all of this, pointing to the same thing. What we're going to see is that we're going to see that there have been many names to describe this area uh, by various people throughout all of time. And I think why this is significant is because when we take a look across culture, uh, we have this constant fight between this religion and that religion. But no one seems to take the time to go out there and do comparative studies. If they had, then what they would find is that all these people are really talking about the same thing. They're just talking about it in different words. So when we look at the Christian texts, for instance, um, and all of the information that's coming out from the images in the various cathedrals, the creation of Adam, triumph of the name of Jesus, which is what I showed you last time, showing the ladder moving into the center of the Orion Nebula and the Mother Jesuit Church. Uh, we have paintings such as the conversion of Saul by Michelangelo, showing Jesus on top of the trapezium. It's all showing us the same thing. It's all tying us to Christ, and Christ is wisdom, and wisdom is associated with the brain. So we say, we hear this um, right here, and this is from that Kabbalah chapter again. This is where they were analyzing the Zohar. Uh, this is the source of wisdom. We see, nevertheless, the divine light penetrates. This is a source of wisdom. It is by wisdom, uh, by virtue of the supreme cause, the name of all the wise God, after which it constructs a great vessel like the sea called intelligence. Whence, hen, uh, whence the name of God the Intelligence. We must know, however, that God is good and wise by virtue of himself, for wisdom does not deserve its name because of itself, because of him who is wise and produces wisdom from the light emanated from him. So that's that light, the center of the Orion Nebula that emanates out and creates wisdom, which is the brain, which is also found in here. You can also listen to that in my previous video. And I highly suggest that you listen to the previous videos so that the questions that you have now uh, most of them, most of them will or have already been addressed in the previous video. So um, this area says is divided 
the sea, the, the vessel of the sea called intelligence, that is also called Bina. Okay? It's also called understanding. And it's also associated to the heart. So wisdom, right up here, this is the light that came forth. This would be the Orion Nebula trapezium, which emanated and created wisdom, which is the brain. And then, interestingly, see what is this is represents the heart and it represents understanding. But when we take a look at the Trinity that's up here, and this is all associated to what we see as the archetype up there, which looks like a brain. And so what this has to do with, according to a lot of Jewish scholars, is that this represents the pineal gland, this represents one hemisphere of the brain, and this represents the other hemisphere of the brain. But I don't like to break it down like that. I like to think of it more of as emanations. We have the first emanation, which is the light, the second emanation, which is the brain, and the third emanation, which is the heart, but it's an understanding and also Bina, but it's it needs to be understood as part of the same area because it mentions in the Kabbalah that all these three are associated to the same thing, which is the same archetype that we see up there. All of the, the, the heart that you see that's in your body, that's in your chest, uh, everything down the spinal cord is a reflection of what we see up here because all the chakras are actually located inside the brain. And the whole spinal cord itself, which exists under this door right here, that those are all reflections of what we see up here. This is the reason why we see things like um, Hermes, for example, says Egypt is the image of heaven or it is the projection below of the order of things above. We can also see the same thing in the Lord's Prayer, for example, uh, where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we see that same projection below of the order of things above. So we have the light that established itself, emanated and created wisdom, and then created the sea, which is understanding. Well, in Proverbs here, we see this. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. That's the top two that we see on the tree of life. Um, and then it says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth, which is the brain. By understanding, he established the heavens. That's the sea that the brain sits in. So as you can see, what is happening here um, is that it's the Bible has all kinds of truth in it and this is something I have always said this is the reason I've always looked at the Bible and the reason I've always quoted from the Bible is because the Bible is correct what has happened over history is it's been misinterpreted but the only way people know that is by going out and doing comparative studies but the truth has been right in front of our face the whole time see but let's take a look at the Egyptian Messiah and what they called the Messiah. And I've got Manly Hall here who's going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to flip over and take a look at some other uh, connecting information that I have out of uh, Isis Unveiled. And Isis Unveiled basically, in, she points to the various areas and describes them. Um, and she describes them being the same kind of things that we keep seeing over and over in all the cathedrals, inside Bible Encyclopedia, what have you. Let's listen to what Manly Hall has to say here. The next point that I think is important to us is the opinion of Hermes concerning the nature of what we term the Messiah. The Egyptians certainly had a messianic tradition. We know that in the later centuries of Egyptian religion, their form of messianic concept was drifting closer and closer to that with which we are now familiar. As early as the 5th or 6th century BC, the Egyptians had already come into the recognition of an intercessing power in nature, an intercessor, a power of salvation or preservation. And this power they variously symbolize 
One of their names for this power was Iesus, a name which is startlingly reminiscent of Jesus. Okay, let's stop right there. That's very significant because this is the 5th or 6th century BC when the Egyptians had this Messiah that they called Iesus, very similar to Jesus. Well, I've got my e-sword up here, and I've uh, clicked on Jesus here, and I've clicked on the name that we see right here, which is the strong source. So when we take a look at Jesus, we can see that the original Greek name is Iesus, same thing that we heard him mention right there. So this is in the 5th or 6th century BC, and they're pointing to the same area uh, that we see, but we'll see that a little bit more here in just a second. Let's listen to a little bit more of what he has to say. In the Hermetic philosophy, we do not have exactly the Christian presentation of the messianic concept. We do have, however, a concept and one which almost certainly has played a part in the rise of Christian philosophy, as this philosophy was unfolded by men like Thomas Aquinas. According to Hermes, that which is eternal, that which has of itself everlastingness, enduring unto all generations, that which has neither a source in time nor in eternity, but a subsistence in foreverness. Now what he's describing right now is he's describing the unseen universe, the what they also call the eternal unseen father. This is the one this is the the abstraction that exists before we see the pillar. And so what he's going to describe, he's describing that it brings itself forth as a restricted manifestation of himself, which is the Son of God, which is Christ, which is this area that we see out here, wisdom. And he brings it forth through this restricted manifestation of himself. So right now he's still describing this thing, this eternal Father that exists as everything brings himself forth. So let him continue here. This power is a lonely ball, incapable of death because essentially incapable of birth, incapable of in any way departing from the totality of its total self. This universality cannot be divided. It is indivisible. There can never be two nor can it divide by some philosophical figure to become a duality. Now what he's describing here is that this unseen father, which consists of everything, cannot divide himself in two. The only way that a division takes place is with inside himself. So everything, which is all a part of the unseen father, the eternal father, divides within himself and creates the second manifestation. So in effect, it's almost like looking at uh, an org chart or a tree, uh, because we have at the very top, we have this one substantiality, this one eternal, infinite power. But since it can't create something separate from itself, think of a tree, it begins to branch out within himself. The only way that it can do that is mentally, and then that's where the whole mental universe comes from. And that is the reason why we see that the firstborn of the infinite, the first begotten, which is Christ, is really a reflection, just like it's mentioned in the Bible, the first begotten is an image of the unseen Father. It is an archetype that represents the same thing as the unseen Father, which is mind. So that is the reason why we see this. It is a reflection of that, but in a restricted sense. As Pythagoras had earlier taught, the only way in which division can be countenanced in the concept of a total divine power is that division is within that power, but that that power itself remains undivided. Thus in the Hermetic philosophy, a certain division occurs within totality. And this 
division blazes forth, not as a separateness, not as a power brought into any possible antagonism with its own cause, but a power which is a somewhat restricted manifestation of totality. That power Hermes calls the divine mind. The divine mind. The divine mind is the same thing as Logos. It's the same thing as Christ. It is the same thing as wisdom. So when we take a look at the tree of life here, you always see what's up here sitting above Kether. You see these this uh, vitality called Ein Sof R, which is limitless light, that constricts itself and then forms this first point inside a physical reality called Kether, which is this right here. Um, and then this begins to emanate and creates wisdom, uh, which sits in the sea of understanding, which is the heavens. So he, this is speaking of emanation coming forth from the unseen universe. The first established visual that we see from the unseen universe is a reflection of itself, which is mind. And that reflection, the, the visible creation of that, is the Christ. And this is the intercessor, Iesus, that uh, is described by the Egyptians and described by Hermes and is described by many other people as we see. So, and this is also what's described in Kabbalah as well. So let's move on to, uh, to some other things I want to show you as far as the connecting dots. Uh, and then we're going to even tie this into some Mayan stuff as well. Uh, the Mayan understanding of where the seat of creation is, which I think you'll find very interesting as well. So this is from Isis Unveiled. This is volume two. She's being a little sarcastic right here because this is what they called heathen philosophy, but as we've seen so far, it is, uh, <laughs> it's all over the, the Bible and we can see it compared to other things. So I've got some notes highlighted for you here. I'm just going to read them out to you. Plato considered the divine nature under threefold modification for the first cause, the reason or logos, and the soul or spirit of the universe. When we talk about universe here, it's also important to understand that universe does not necessarily mean all of the whole of the substantiality. It means the universe that we exist in. Another way of thinking about this is <clears throat> if you've ever played one of those virtual online games, you know, it exists as a whole universe within, with inside that game, but we all know that there's a universe that exists outside of that, and that's our universe. So if we think of it in that manner, um, as that we exist inside our own little universe, that uh, that we can see all of these things, it's almost as a matrix that we exist inside. Uh, so three archaeal, uh, archaeal or original principles, says Gibbon. Uh, represented in the Platonic system as three gods united with each other by a mysterious and ineffable generation, blending this transcendental idea with the more hypostatic figure of the Logos, of Philo, whose doctrine was of the, of the oldest Kabbalah, and who viewed the King Messiah as the Metatron. So here we have another name for it, right? Or the Angel of the Lord the Legatus, or descended in flesh, but not the Ancient of Days himself. The first eternal number is the Father, or the Chaldean primeval, invisible, incomprehensible chaos. Now that's what the unseen Father that we talk about, that's the whole totality of everything. Out of which proceeded the intelligible one, the Egyptian Ta, or the principle of light, Ta, or the one that's, that forms everything from a potter's wheel, not the light itself and the principle of life through himself no life. The wisdom, which we've seen, by which the Father created the heavens is the Son, or the Kabbalistic androgynous Adam Cadman. So now we see the Adam Cadman tied to Christ as well. Adam Cadman is actually the first Adam that's, that's shown in Genesis when it describes talking about how God created Adam, this is the same thing because he's the first human that God created. It's the same thing as Christ. The sun is at once the male Ra, or light of wisdom, prudence or intelligence, Sephira, the, the female part of himself. The female part of himself, that's the Bina that we see on the, on the other side of the Trinity. 
while from this dual being proceeds the third emanation, Bina or Reason, the second intelligence. See, this is all confirmed that we've seen in, in, in the Bible, in Kabbalah, and everything. Therefore, strictly speaking, there is a uh, tetractus or quaternary consisting of the unintelligible first monad and its triple emanation, which properly constitute our trinity. Now you know where the trinity comes from. It's this emanation that occurs from the unseen to the first point to the creation of wisdom that it emanates out. Wisdom founds, finds the earth with inside the heavens, which is Bina and understanding. This Kabbalistic conception is thus proved identical with that of the Hindu philosophy. Whoever reads Plato and his dialogue, Timaeus, will find that these ideas as faithfully re-echoed by the Greek philosopher. Moreover, the injunction of the secrecy was as strict with the Kabbalists as it was the initiates of the Adita or Hindu yogis. Okay. Mary, you'll see. When S Cyril, the bishop of Alexandria, had openly embraced the cause of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and had anthropomorphized her into Mary, the mother of God, and the Trinitarian controversy had taken place from that moment, the Egyptian doctrine of the emanation of the creative God out of em Emeft began to be tortured in a thousand ways until the council agreed upon the adoption, as it is now stands, the disfigured temerary of the Kabbalistic Solomon and Philo. But as its origin, uh, origin was yet too evident, the word was no longer called the heavenly man, which is the same as Adam, primal Adam, Cadman, but became the Logos, Christ. So now we see Adam Cadman, the first Adam, and was made as old as the ancient of ancient, his father. The concealed wisdom became identical with its emanation, the divine thought, and made to be regarded co-equal and co-eternal with its first manifestation. So we see that same thing that we see in Colossians 1.15, where Christ is the first emanation from the unseen. Mind, the latter, emanated from itself the Logos. The Logos of the Word of John emanated in its turn phronesis, or the intelligences, the divine human spirits. These were personified the attributes of the mysterious Godhead, the Gnostic Quinturnian, typifying this five spiritual but intelligible substances. And it's a little deep. When the unseen when the uncreated, unnamed father, that's the that's the unseen that we see talked about before the emanation that we see right here, saw the corruption of mankind, he sent forth his first born Noahs. So now we have another name for Christ again. Into the world in the form of Christ. See, there's a confirmation. For the redemption of all who believe in him out of the power of those who fabricated the world. In the ideas of Christian, Christ is but another name for Jesus. The philosophy of the Gnostics, the initiates and hierophants understood it otherwise. The word Christos, Christo, like all Greek words, must be sought in its philosophical origin, the Sanskrit. In this latter language, Christ means sacred, and the Hindu deity was named Krishna, the pure or the sacred from that. On the other hand, the Greek Christos bears several meanings as anointed, pure oil, chrism, and others. In all languages, through the synonym of the word means the pure or sacred essence is the first emanation again. See, we have that emanation of the invisible Godhead manifesting itself in tan tangibly in spirit. This is the same thing that we see in the Bible. Thus Christos as a unity, but, uh, but is but an abstraction, a general idea. This is the Plato's ideas, representing the collective aggregation of the numberless spiritual entities, which are direct emanations of the infinite, invisible, incomprehensible first cause. So there again, we have this description of this infinite emanating itself into the seen universe, which starts as a pillar, emanates out, creates wisdom, which is the brain, that sits in the sea, which is intelligence. The earth is founded off of wisdom, the brain. And this is why we see the mirror of the both of them. Now this is really interesting. Uh, in the oldest Oriental Kabbalah, the deity is represented as three circles in one, shrouded in a certain smoke or chaotic exhalation. 
In the preface to the Sohar, which transforms the three, three primordial circles into three heads, over these is described an exhalation or smoke, neither black nor white, but colorless, and circumscribed within a circle. This is the unknown essence. The origin of the Jewish image may perhaps be traced to Hermes Pimander, which we've heard before, the Egyptian Logos, and this is interesting, who appears within a cloud of human nature, with a smoke escaping from it, in the Zohar. So, here we are right here. This is the human cloud, which is being described as the Logos, which is being described as Christ once again. And that description brings us to the uh, Mayan stuff here. This is on this is on MiradorPark.com. Um, Mirador Park has the oldest Mayan pyramid. It sits in the cradle of the Mayan civilization that we have right here. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of this to you here. And if you notice, what we're seeing here is Orion in their description. This is their pyramid, and we see the three columns representing an El Tigre complex and the understanding of the Orion constellation and what those three things are, which is the three hearthstones of creation, which are Alnatak, Saif, and Rigel that we see right here. It was also called the Turtle constellation. Now if you wonder why we see all of these representations of Orion all over the ground, uh, uh, all over the place as far as Orion correlations because these people, these ancients, were pointing to the same thing which is the same Messiah or the same Logos that we see um, which is the Orion Nebula. And what they show here the three hearthstones and in the middle of it we have the Orion Nebula which is the smoke from the hearth. To them the astronomy was an everyday matter as it was intertwined with their religion and their agriculture. All the heavenly bodies probably had a deep mythical and spiritual meaning as if they did. Uh, reality might seem to suggest that they continue to do so this day among their descendants. Their agricultural practices throughout Chiapas and Guatemalan highlands, which have been extensively documented, point to the use of three of the positions of stars as guiding directors for the times to plant harvest and prepare the seeds for the following year. Research and thorough excavations at Maya archaeology sites, particularly dating from the pre-classic Maya period, have revealed that both uh, the early and modern Maya have much in common, which is unique to the uh, ancient inhabitants of sites such as El Mirador is that they also recreated their mythological beliefs and astronomical interpretations and the symbolism represented in their grand ceremonial architecture. The triadic pattern comes to mind as we will try to explain a bit more in the detail of this section. What archaeologist Richard Hansen believes the triadic pattern was a representation of the Maya's creation myth. It portrayed the place of origin which they represented in everyday life as well as in every Maya home. These three stones, known as the three hearth stones or ox, uh, Te Tun, are found in every Maya kitchen even today. Where they fire, they cook and recreate the celestial image. Other Maya archaeologists have dedicated much to the thought of these questions. The following quotes in bibliography uh, are especially recommended and essential reading for everyone interested in approaching the study of ancient religion in Mesoamerica. The triangle is formed by these three hearthstones, and at the center is an area the Am Amaya identified as the place of origin, the seat of creation, represented by the smoke that comes out of the burning fire, which is the Orion Nebula, which is the same as the origin of the Jewish image may be traced to Hermes, who appears in a cloud of human nature with a smoke escaping from it. That's the same as what we see right here. So, these are the three hearth stones, either the smoke that's in the middle of it, the cloud, the humid cloud with the smoke coming from it, the seat of creation, we can see right here, and it's now confirmed in the Mayan culture as well, but we have another thing we want to add to that that even makes it more interesting. Okay, so you remember, and it was about a couple of videos ago, I showed you the mirror that we have here uh, between 
the Earth and what we see here in the Orion Nebula. And if we zoom in, we can see the face even easier. And when we zoom all the way into the Nile Delta, we can see these certain images are repeated all the way through, and even the shape uh, that we see of the um, trapezium versus the Nile Delta. Just like we can see the copies that we see right here, which looks like Jordan here. And this can be expanded all the way out where you see that the very center of the circle here sits at the very base of the trapezium and the, and the circle here sits at the base of the Nile Delta and we can see that the waterways that divide the two land masses here are also shown right here as well. <clears throat> so we have this mirror that exists between these two. Now if you remember from last time we listened to this this macroprosophus, or the long face, rises above the horizon of infinites, like a sun rising from darkness. And because this horizon of infinites resembles more than anything else a great ocean, it is represented as a mirror. And as the face rises above, the reflection of the face inverted appears in the ocean beneath. And therefore, we have the two great faces, one looking down, one looking up from the shadows below. Okay, so you remember that from last time. So now we have a confirming uh, piece from the Mayan stuff as well. Now, these are the three hearthstones of creation right here. The seat of creation, which is the Orion Nebula that we see right here, which is the smoke it comes from the hearth which is the same thing that we read right here a cloud of human nature with a smoke escaping from it same thing and then we have right here the act of seating the stones in the triangular pattern of the hearth created an image on the face of the earth and in the sky at the same time and that's why we have the mirror between the two this represents wisdom which is the brain which is the archetypal region of which the earth was founded upon. So now we have our Mayan connection as well, as well as other names that I've shown you that exist as the Logos, the Adam Cadman, um, the Noahs, all of these various names that all tie to the same thing. And if people believe that the Egyptian pyramids, obviously pointing to Orion, we're not specifically pointing to the Orion Nebula after all this, especially considering that the trapezium itself matches the same slopes as the pyramid. I don't see how anybody can um, cannot see that this is completely obvious by now. So I thought you might find that interesting. So now we have our Mayan connection, so I wanted to circle around and show you that. You guys have a great weekend. I'll talk to you soon.